Chapter Seven of the Seven Sleuths Club. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Seven Sleuths Club by Carol Norton. Chapter Seven: An Unwilling Hostess. Meanwhile, in the handsome home of Colonel Wainwright, on the hill road overlooking the distant lake, a very disconcerted girl sat staring moodily into the fireplace of a luxuriously furnished living room. Her brother stood near, leaning against the mantelpiece. "'I won't stay here,' Geraldine declared, her dark eyes flashing rebelliously. "'I won't. I won't. Father has no right to send me to this backwoods country village. What if he was born here?' That was surely his misfortune, and no sensible reason why I should be condemned to be buried here for a whole winter. But, sister mine, the boy said in a consolatory tone, I've been trying to tell you that there are some nice girls living in Sunnyside, but you won't let me. If you would join their school life, you would soon be having a jolly time. That's what I mean to do. Alfred Morrison, I don't see how you came by such plebeian ideas. I should think that you would be ashamed to have your sister attending a district school when you know that I have always been a pupil at the most fashionable seminary and have associated only with the best people. What makes them best, sister? The girl tapped one daintily slippered foot impatiently as she said scathingly, Alfred, you are so provoking sometimes. You know the Ellingsworths and the Drexels and all the people are considered the best in Dorchester. Alfred was about to reply that there was a family of Drexels living in Sunnyside. But, luckily, before he had said it, his attention was attracted by the ringing of a cowbell, which seemed to be out in the driveway. Geraldine also heard, but did not look up. Some delivery wagon, she thought. But Alfred, who stood so that he could look out of the window, understood what was happening when he saw the village girls descending from a delivery sleigh. They slipped out of their fur coats, leaving them in Johnny's care, and appeared in shawls and old-fashioned capes. For a puzzled moment, Alfred gazed. Then, as something of the meaning of the joke flashed over him, he almost laughed aloud. Luckily, Geraldine continued to stare moodily into the fire, nor did she look up when Alfred left the room. Before the girls on the porch had time to ring the bell, the boy opened the door, and, stepping out, he asked quietly, but with twinkling eyes, "'Why the masquerade?' "'Don't you dare spoil the joke,' Mary warned when she had told him that since his sister had expected them to be milkmaids, they had not wanted to disappoint her." Then she informed him, "'My name is Miss Turnip. You introduce me, and I'll introduce the others.' Alfred's eyes were laughing, but in a low voice he said, "'I'm game.' Then aloud he exclaimed, "'How do you do, Miss Turnip? I am so glad that you came to call. Bring your friends right in. My sister will be pleased to meet you.' Mary, in telling Jack about it afterwards, said that Alfred played his part as though he had been practising it for weeks." Sister Geraldine, he called pleasantly to the girl who had risen and was standing haughtily by the fireplace, permit me to present the young ladies who live in Sunnyside. They have very kindly called to welcome you to their village. The newcomers all made bobbing curtsies, and, to her credit, be it said, that even little Betty did not giggle. But, oh, how hard it was not to! Of course there had been classes in good breeding in the Dorchester Seminary. One of the rules often emphasised was that it did not matter how a hostess might feel towards a guest, she must not be rude in her own home. So Geraldine bowed coldly and asked the young ladies to be seated. Alfred, daring to remain no longer, bolted to his room and laughed so hard that he said afterwards that he couldn't get his face straight for a week. Peggy Pierce, being the best actress among the sunny seven, had been asked to take the lead, and so, when they were all seated as awkwardly as possible, she began. "'My name is Mirandy Perkins. We all heard as how o come to town, and so we thought as how we drop in and ask o if you jine with our literary society. We do have the best times. Next week we're going to have a pumpkin social. Each gal is to bring a pumpkin pie, and each fellow is to bring a many pennies as he is old to help buy a new town pump for the square. That's why it's called a pumpkin social. This remark was unexpected, not having been planned at the dress rehearsal, and it struck Rosamond as being so funny that she spluttered suspiciously, and, taking out a big red cotton handkerchief, she changed the laugh into a sneeze. Geraldine sat stiffly gazing at her callers with an expression that would have frozen them to silence had they been as truly rural as they were pretending, but, if she had only known it, these country girls had been attending a school every bit as fashionable as the seminary of which she so often boasted. 
"'I thank you,' that young lady replied, "'but it is not my intention to remain in this backwoodsy place. "'I plan leaving here next week at the latest. "'Well, now, it ain't that too bad. "'We thought as how it would be such an addition to our society,' "'Peggy continued her part. "'Of course we all feel real citified ourselves. "'We get the latest styles right from Dorchester for our toggins.' "'Toggins?' Geraldine repeated icily. "'Just what are they?' There surely was a titter somewhere, but Peggy, pretending to be surprised, remarked, "'Why, toggins are hats, and things like Jerushi's here.' She nodded at the caricature of a red hat with green and pink trimmings which was perched on Rosamond's head. Mary returned to the rehearsal lines from which they had been sidetracked. "'You'd enjoy a literary society, I'm sure,' she said, "'being as you had a literary sort of look. We meet once a week around different houses. We sew on things for the missionary barrel, and then one of us reads aloud from the Farmer's Weekly.' just then the clock on the mantelpiece chimed the hour of four and peggy sprang up cricket she exclaimed here's tis come in on dark most and me not home to milk those cows and i got a churn yet before supper doris drexel ventured her first remark luckily geraldine did not glance at the soft white hands of the speaker they were all smiling in the friendliest fashion but as soon as they were outside and riding away in their queer equipage they shouted and laughed as they had never laughed before her highness will probably leave town to-morrow doris remarked but if she does the town will be well rid of her i wonder if we put it on too thick bertha questioned as they were slipping on their fur coats which they had left in the sleigh i was afraid she would see through our joke i don't believe she did mary said alfred told jack that his sister got her ideas of girls who live in country villages from the moving pictures and they are always as outlandishly dressed as we are well, it'll be interesting to see what comes of our nonsense, Gertrude remarked. On the whole, I feel rather sorry for that poor, unhappy girl. When Alfred saw the queer equipage disappearing, he descended to the library. Oh, hello, sis, he said. Have your callers gone? Geraldine's eyes flashed, and she stamped her small foot as she said, Alfred Morrison, I just know that you asked those dreadful creatures to call on me. I suppose you would like to have me attend their pumpkin social, which is to be given to raise money to buy a town pump. This was too much for Alfred, and he laughed heartily. "'Well,' he said at last, when he could speak, "'I take my hat off to the young ladies of Sunnyside. They are the cleverest damsels that I ever met.' So saying, he disappeared, fearing that he would break his promise to Mary and reveal that it was all a joke if he remained any longer with his indignant sister. Geraldine would probably have packed her trunk that very night and departed the next day if she had sufficient money with which to buy a ticket, but for some reason her monthly allowance from her father had been delayed.' End of chapter 7